So good morning everyone and welcome to the Monday morning colloquium here at HITS. It's a great pleasure to have Atta Koban visiting us. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham at the Department of Computer Science and she's working on some very interesting topics. Topics we are interested in because we are interested in some applications and actually she is working on the foundations, on theory behind those things and she is giving a really great talk on um, compressed sensing and how to deal with information. And without any further delaying your talk, please Atta, go ahead. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. So today's talk is about how random projections can help us to build theory for machine learning and how this leads to new algorithms for learning from high dimensional data sets. As you know, random projections is also used in compressed sensing and there will be some analogies with that field. Um, we will pursue two goals. The first one is quite old. It asks a fundamental question about learning by machines. Given a machine learning task, what kinds of data distribution make it easier or harder? So if, for example, if you have a two-class classification problem, you get some data, you run your classifier, sometimes it works really well, sometimes it works not so well. So what makes the difference? It's an old question, and some things are known about it, but we should know, try to figure out more. A newer question comes nowadays when we get bigger and bigger data sets, large dimensional data sets, and we run into computational problems, feasibility problems to run our algorithms. So given a high dimensional learning tasks, when can we solve it from a few random projections of it? So random projections as a, as a way to reduce dimensionality so that our algorithms work more efficiently. But when can we do this? So two different questions. And I'm going to use the second of these questions as a surrogate for the first. Because the second is more manageable. It's more approachable. It's, it's feasible. Uh, some pictures for the first question and then for the second question. So these are all elephants, these are some other kinds of animals. If the problem is to learn a classifier that tells apart these two different groups of objects, then that's an easy problem. They are quite different, right? And they are well separated. But if the problem is to tell apart these, uh, say, uh, Asian elephant from Indian elephant, that's a harder problem because they are more similar. So how can we quantify difficulty of the problems or easiness levels of the problems and, and how can we use those to learn more efficiently. And then you can say, well, you already knew this, at least for two class classification. If these are one group, these are the other group. So every textbook tells you you should separate them by the maximum margin. That's what the SVM is doing. Well, yes, but really. Not always. So this is exactly the same data set. All these points are the same as the previous slide, but there are four more points there. Well, if you go for the maximum margin, then such points can, can uh, fool us. So the maximum margin classifier is now this. But it should really have been the same as here. A picture for the new question. So we have high dimensional data which here on the picture are three-dimensional points drawn in on a two-dimensional screen. But in reality, we can have gene expression measurements of thousands and thousands of dimensions, for example. And then when can we just look at the randomly oriented slice and solve the problem? In other words, if this is the original data with all the details, fine details, then can we just look at a random projection of it, which of course will distort some of it and still learn what is important from the, f f about the original problem. How can we find it in the, 
in the compressed version of the problem. Now, in order to deal with these questions, we need some backgrounds. I, I will, I will uh, expose three different angles that these problems are already in the literature or have been when I started working on it. The first one is a famous result by Johnson and Linde Strauss, which in, is an existence result, was at the time, which says that there exists a mapping that takes high dimensional points and transforms them, maps them into low dimensional points, and the pairwise distances remain almost unchanged. So that's quite quite a surprising result. But at the time, in uh, 80 something, it's on the next slide, in 84, uh, this was formulated as an existence result. So here is the detailed statement. It says that if we choose a tolerance level epsilon and we have a data set of endpoints, then it's enough to, to uh, compress it to k dimensions, which is of order logarithmic on the num in the number of points, and after the, this transformation, the pairwise distances remain the same as they were up to a multiplicative error of 1 plus or minus epsilon. Now, if that's the case, then people took this result in machine learning and devised algorithms that work on randomly projected data. So there is early work in, from 1999 on uh, perceptron, which was said to uh, be more biologically plausible. So maybe the brain does something similar. Uh, so we randomly project the data, we learn a perceptron, and then they use this uh, johnson linde strauss lemma and uh, find that you can actually prove that you can learn the classes similar approach for regression. Now one thing that I should have said, it's on the slide, but, but I should uh, stress it, that in addition to this uh, existence result from uh, 84, then in 2002, there is a constructive proof of the same result, which gives you how to find this mapping. And all you need to do, it turns out, to construct a random matrix, a matrix that has fewer uh, rows than columns, pre-multiply the data and uh, get your random projection of the data, and it will satisfy this condition with high probability. So this random matrix has to be somewhat spe special. So for example, it works if you take uh, Gaussian entries, IID from, say, standard Gaussian, or any uh, sub-Gaussian entries, which means distributions that have lighter tails than Gaussian, and there are some other construction. So basically, a random projection implements this mapping. Now, of course, that's nice, but the problem is that k, the reduced dimension, needs to be logarithmic on the number of points. So let's think about it. If we have a training set of n points, then we need to compress to log n order of dimensions. Now, of course, if the original dimension was some millions, then it's good news because the new dimension doesn't depend on the original dimension. So million dimension you start with, you have a few hundreds of points, you can compress it to log of that. But on the other hand, it's unnatural because one would expect that if I have a bigger training set with more points, then the learning becomes easier. Whereas this tells me that if you have more points, then you can only compress so much by logarithmic of the, in the number of points. So it's unnatural. A different angle in which these ideas appear in the literature is compressed sensing. So in compressed sensing, there is a property called RIP, or Restricted Isometry Property, which looks similar, I have it on the next slide, the, similar to the johnson linde strauss lemma, except there is a different condition on it. So it says, if you have data that is sparse, namely S, uh, S sparse means that 
s of the entries in each point are not zero, the rest are all zero, then from a random projection of the data, you can have this guarantee of non-preservation. So obviously, instead of x, you can put x minus y, and you get exactly the same guarantee as in the previous slide. But now, k has to be of order s log d. So it's no longer log n. It's s log d. It's good news, because now if we apply this to machine learning, then we can reduce the dimension to uh, s log d rather than log n. So no longer is the unnatural scaling with the number of points. But the bad news is that the data has to be as sparse. So what happens if the data, in fact, not as sparse, in fact, it's enough to have an as sparse representation. So that means that there it must exist a linear basis in which representing the data has s non-zeros but not more non-zeros. But what happens if that's not the case? It's hard to believe that for learning, we need that condition. Anyway, this is from compressed sensing. So their goal is different from learning. Their goal is to recover the signal. And there is a result by Kande and Tao from 2006. And of course, nowadays, there are improved results on this. But this was one of the first, which says that if the signal was as sparse, just like here, and you have a random matrix that satisfies the RIF property, then it's enough to measure a random projection of the data x. And you can recover it exactly by doing a convex optimization problem. Good. So people, of course, took it into machine learning. And there is a paper saying that you can do ordinary squares regression for sparse data given the same conditions as in compressed sensing, that you can do SVM on sparse data, and so on. The problem, as I already mentioned, is that for learning, intuition says that sparsity of the representation might not be the most relevant thing. The third angle in which these problems were uh, attacked in the literature is from the machine learning field. So, so far we have seen this Johnson, Linder, Strauss, Lemma, which comes from uh, metric geometry, and it was taken into machine learning. We have seen compressed sensing that comes from uh, signal processing literature and taken into machine learning. Now, this one it, uh, originate, these ideas originate in machine learning. Namely, we know that large margin is great for classification, so they assume there is a large margin, then what happens to it after random projection? And they can show that if the margin was large enough, then after random projection, you still have a reasonable size of margin, in fact, half of what it was. And another paper then questioned it, is it really the case? Uh, maybe the margin is not always preserved, and there was some controversy about the obtuse angles, which we cleared up in uh, 2015 in a KDD paper. Uh, so my question, my problem with this is maybe margin is not the most important thing after all, or maybe there is something more general. So it's great if we know there is a margin, but what if there is no margin? It might still be some structure that helps us. So the roadmap for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you on a linear classifier, a linear classification problem that we can quantify the error for the compressive classifier, and the things that matter for it are, can be used to better understand learning in general, in the original problem, the original without random projection in the algorithm. And then, depending on the time, I will show that the same can be done for an unconstrained uh, classification task through uh, nearest neighbor. So the first one is very constrained. It's linear classifier. But it doesn't have to be linear. And in the end, I'm going to show you that whatever we lose by using the compression of the data, the random projection of the data, we can 
gain it back if we combine several of those compressive classifiers into an ensemble. So linear classification, easy, the easiest and most fundamental problem in machine learning. So we have a training set of n points. X is the input, Y is the label, and the label is minus one one. We have a function class, which in this case is linear. And we choose a loss function, which in this case is the zero one loss, because we want to do classification, so either we got the class right or not, zero, one. The goal is to find a classifier in this class such that its generalization error or risk defined here is as small as possible. So how is this defined? The generalization error of the classifier through the loss is the expected error it makes on new data, new input x. So what's the expectation that it predicts it wrong, that the predicted label will be different from y. So why is this a hard problem? It's because of this expectation. So the expectation is with respect to the distribution of the data, but we don't know the distribution of the data. So we can't calculate the expectation. Therefore, we can't minimize it. So uh, learning theory looks at ways to bound this quantity without having to know the distribution of the data. And one uh, quantity that replaces this quite often is the empirical risk. So instead of expectation, we take average over the training points, x and y. And that's called the empirical risk minimization algorithm. But there are others, so it doesn't have to be that all the time. The optimal classifier is the one that indeed achieves the smallest generalization error, we don't have it, but for theoretical bounds, we want to know how far we reach to that. What is known is that for linear classifiers, the generalization error uh, difference from the empirical error, so that's the training error, that's the generalization error, is of this order. So that theory is well developed 20 years ago. Uh, there is upper bound to the to this error and lower bound, and they match up to a log factor. And what it says is square root of the dimension of the data divided by the number of points. So in general, without assuming anything else, for linear classification, we need the number of points to grow linearly with the dimension in order to guarantee anything. So here we are interested in the case when that is not guaranteed, so we have some n number of training points, but dimension can be larger, and sometimes substantially larger than the number of points. So what can we then say? This old guarantee says nothing. So what we are going to do is reduce the dimension. And of course, there are many ways to do that. There is principal component analysis, independent component analysis, many, many other dimensionality reduction methods. And one of the problems is how to analyze what is their effect. So in practice, sometimes they work, sometimes they not. And, and in general, little can be said. As opposed, if we use random projections to reduce the dimension, then we can analyze what is going on. So that's what we are going to do. Our random matrix, just the same as I have shown in previous slides, in the background slides, so fewer rows than columns and uh, random entries, IID from sub-Gaussian distribution. Training set as before. Now we are going to take each uh, point, each input point, and pre-multiply by this random matrix. That reduces the dimension, and it's computationally reasonably cheap. So it's not like PCA that you have to calculate eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Here, all you have to do is a uh, matrix uh, vector multiplication. This induces, in the small dimensional space, a linear classifier. In fact, we can have here a bias term, a shifting term, but I'm not uh, putting it here because it's simpler for simplicity. So this function class takes k-dimensional inputs, 
in the smaller space and does the linear uh, transformation, the sign of which gives the prediction. And we are going to specifically look at the empirical risk minimi minimizer algorithm. So that is looking for the smallest training error, the classifier that achieves smallest training error after random projection. We want to know how good it is. So what is the generalization error of this classifier? So what did we do? We have high dimensional data, we randomly squash it, and then we ask how good is the classifier that we learn in on that data. There are two quantities of randomness. One is the sampling of the training set, so how lucky or unlucky we are in the training set, specific training set that we got, and the R that we use for dimensionality reduction. And we are going to look at those two goals, the same two goals as we started off with. So what is, what can we guarantee about the compressive classifier, and then whatever we learn from it, how can we understand better the original problem. Some tools. So I have two slides of just definitions and existing results that we are building on. So complexity measures. Given a set T of points, so that T can be the data support or it can be the outputs of, the, of a function given the data. So it just has to be a bounded set T. Then this quantity here, the expected supremum of dot product of points from the set T uh, with Gaussian random vectors is called the Gaussian width or the Gaussian complexity. So it basically tells you how complex is, how uh, similar is the set of points X to randomly drawn vectors because dot product is like a similarity measure. So when this is small, it means that X is similar to G. So for each uh, random draw of a Gaussian vector, can I find in T a point that is quite similar to it? Uh, similar quantity, Rademacher complexity. So it's basically the same concept, except that now the set T is going to be a function set. So there are classifiers in it. And, and uh, in fact, uh, it's not the full function. It's only the, so the coordinates of those points in F are the outputs of a function measured in the training point x1 up to xn. And then this sum is nothing else than a dot product. And this is how it's defined. It's defined in the literature uh, with division with this constant n. The difference is that here we had a Gaussian vector, here we have a so-called Rademacher vector, which means that we draw minus ones and ones uh, with the same probability. So this measures how complex is the function class F with respect to the training set. It's called the empirical Rademacher complexity. And there is, of course, the more classic notion of VC dimension, which is the, the size of the largest set that can be completely shattered, namely uh, elements of this function class are able to label these points in all possible ways. So it's known, for example, that for linear classifier going through the origin, then the VC dimension would be the dimension of the number, uh, dimension of the data. Uh, existing results on generalization error uh, that we are going to use is the Rademacher bound, which says you can bound the uh, generalization error by the training error plus twice the Rademacher complexity of the function class through the rows plus a small error term. And the VC bound says you can also bound for, for specifically for zero, one, loss and binary classification, you can bound the generalization error by the training error plus the VC dimension plus some small error. Thing to look, to, to, to see here is that this VC dimension is 
going to be d for linear classifier. And this Rademacher complexity in the case when we talk about unconstrained uh, linear classifiers with zero one loss is bounded by the VC dimension. So they are basically the same order. They say the same thing. And in addition, so those are classic results that they are using. In addition, we came up with a new tool as well, the, the notion of side flipping probability. So this is, so you have, if you have two high dimensional vectors and you project them randomly with a random projection matrix from D dimension, which is high, to k dimension, which is low, then what's the probability that the sign of the dot product is going to flip? So if it was an, an acute angle, what's the, like, what's the probability that after random projection it's going to be a, become a, an obtuse angle, and vice versa? And yeah, for, for random projection that is Gaussian, it has IID Gaussian entries, we are able to calculate this exactly. Is this expression here. And the way this can be proved very easily is if you use a parallelogram law to decompose this into two quadratic terms, then, there I then this probability is nothing else than a quadratic term smaller than another one. And they are independent. One can show that they are independent. Then you just divide through by the second one, and you get a chi-square divided by another independent chi-square, that's an S distribution. So this is the, the cumulative density function of the S, S distribution, F distribution uh, at the point zero. Okay, and then the probability that the sign flips after random projection is just this one on the positive half and one minus that one on the negative half. And we also have an upper bound, which is quite uh, quite uh, nice to have because it gives us some interpretation. So this integral, okay, exact form, but what does it mean? From this upper bound, you can see, well, it's uh, exponentially decreasing with the uh, dimension to which you compressed and, it, uh, and with the square of the cosine of the original angle, which has a nice inter interpretation as margin. You will see that in one of those coming slides. This is how the function fk looks like. So on the x-axis, we have the angle between the original two vectors, the high dimensional vectors, and the y-axis, the probability that the sign is going to flip of the dot products. And so on this part, no, oh, on, th on this part, from zero to uh, pi by two, uh, the original angle is acute, and here you see the as we as we approach pi by two, then the probability that the sign is going to flip increases, and it's exactly half at pi by two, and the opposite on the other side. So here the original angle was obtuse. And then what's the probability that it will be, uh, that it will remain obtuse, this. And if we want the, the flipping, then it would go, this one would go down in a symmetric way. So this is the function f, this f. Okay. We can also do it for sub-Gaussian matrix. Then we can't calculate the exact form, but we still have an upper bound. The sub-Gaussian distribution is uh, defined as a distribution whose tail decay faster than the Gaussian. So that's the formal definition. And we have almost the same bound, except that here it's eight instead of two. Good. And now the first result on, on uh, compressive ERM, so empirical risk minimization classifier. So we took the high dimensional data, compressed it randomly, learned the classifier was the error. Well, the error turns out to be the generalization error is bounded by the following. First, take an original classifier, any one that you like, from the original high dimensional set of classifiers. And the training error of that one 
plus a VC term of a k-dimensional classifier plus some more error, where this is the flipping probability and this is the deviation of the average flipping event to the probability of flipping. But what to notice here, if uh, you pick this age such that this empirical error term is small, then these first two terms look like a VC bound of a k-dimensional classifier. k is small compared to d. And then the rest of the terms are the price that we pay. So if we were in the original space, this would be d, much larger. So that means the complexity of, uh, of the function class, of course, is reduced by reducing the dimension, and this is the price to pay. But the price to pay, this one can be computed from the training set. We count up, uh, we, uh, yes, we average the flipping probabilities on the training set. And then this, if the flipping probabilities are small, then this will be small. And if this is smaller than that one, then, then uh, we are doing well. Now observe that if k is chosen as d, so basically we don't do the compression at all, then the first two terms are exactly the VC bound, and this goes away because there is no flipping. We didn't, we didn't randomly project, so there is no flipping. Then this goes away, therefore this goes away, and we recover the original VC bound. Same can be done uh, in for excess risk bound, so this, instead of looking at the difference between the generalization error and training error, here we look at the difference between generalization error and the error of the best possible classifier in the class. And this is just classical, we're following the step, the same, the steps of the original theory, the same form of bound comes up. So the things to notice, I already told you in the previous slide, then the first two terms match uh, VC bound uh, of a k-dimensional classifier. Uh, the last two terms pay the price for it. Uh, I told you all this. Now we can make these last two terms as small as we like. So we pick an epsilon, say 0 0.0001, and we want these last two terms to be no bigger than that. We can do that by using the upper bound on this flipping probability we get that k has to be bigger than some constant here that depends on epsilon we have chosen, the delta that was here, and this is the margin on that data. So if the data is separable with a margin, uh, I have a different slide to show you that that's indeed the margin. So remember this was the flipping probability and this is the bound on it for sub-Gaussian case, and then cos of the theta, say, this is the vertical line is the separation boundary, this is the normal to it, so the age of the, our, our classifier age, and say here is a point, x. So this is the angle theta between them. Therefore, the distance between this point and the separating uh, hyperplane is exactly cosine of theta. So cosine of theta is the margin. And so basically what we have here is that the reduced dimension has to be one, uh, proportional to one over the margin on the, of age on the data. So what if there is no margin? Oops, I wanted to show you the, the proof of this at least the sketch of proof of this theorem. So do you believe the theorem, by the way? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so first we take R fixed. So the random projection is an instance of uh, possibilities and it's fixed. Then we apply a classical VC bound in the small dimension, k-dimensional space, we get this. So this term, we are happy. This term is, can be large, can be quite large, so we don't know how large it is until we bound it, because this is the empirical error 
of the classifier that we learned on the projective set. And so we bound this. We take uh, an arbitrary age, any one that we like, from the original uh, classifier set. And, and it's always true that the empirical error of, this, of the compressive classifier is smaller than the empirical error of the projected version of this age, because this was the empirical risk minimizer, so it's chosen specifically to minimize the term. And then from here, then now we have a dot product after random projection. So we can bound it with the average of the flipping probability of the points that were originally classified correctly. These are the points that are on the correct side, and this is the flipping, so that after random projection, it, it switches to the wrong side. And finally, we bound this from its expectations, so we get the flipping probabilities. So that's how that is proven. It's quite easy, this. Now, I have shown you that we can get the last two terms below epsilon by choosing k this way. But we can only choose k this way if this is positive. And so if it's not, we can still do it because then we can, we can introduce a margin parameter instead. And we collect all the points whose, uh, margi whose margin is smaller than, than that uh, parameter. And then this parameter appears everywhere, but otherwise the bound still holds. So fk uh, gamma of theta is just fk of the points that have margin larger than gamma. So that's a classical trick that we can do. Another variant, if R was Gaussian, then we can use the exact form, and now we get this bound. So the difference between this and what we had before, now we don't have the, the zero, one errors on the training set, but they are combined with the flipping probabilities. And this f, remember, it was both sides. So it, it's the probability that the sign is negative after random projection. So it was, if it was negative, there is some chance that they become positive. And this bound captures that as well. So it, there is some chance that the original classifier in the high dimensional space would get the point wrong. After random projection, it gets right. Both are captured here. Good. Additionally, I told you that those last two terms can be made smaller than epsilon, but what if we don't want, if we want them to disappear? No epsilon. Because if that epsilon is there, it's a bias term. So it's interesting, at least theoretically, to figure out when th that would not be there. So we can do it. We can get a bound like this, which is just like the first two terms of the previous bound, and nothing else, if we take k of this size. Now, what is this? This is the Gaussian width of a set. And that set is defined here. So we take all the points normalized by, this length, by their length, which I should have te told you early on that that can be done without loss of generality, because all we are looking at is the sign of the dot product. So the length of the vectors inside can be made uh, unit length without any loss of generality. So we take all these length normalized points together with their, uh, so product with their label, and then we take out of those only the ones that have margin bigger than gamma. So basically this set is the set of all points, all possible points in the support of the data distribution that are classified correctly by age with a margin gamma. So it turns out that if we take k of the order square of the Gaussian widths of that set, the Gaussian widths was one of, on one of the previous slides about complexity measures, you remember, where I said the Gaussian widths of a set, it measures how similar are the points from the set from Gaussian drawn random points. 
So yes, so so then, of course, it's interesting to know when would this be small. I didn't put that on the slides, but there are examples where that is small. And one classical example is the same as in compressed sensing, when the this set contains s parse vectors, then that will be of order s log d, just like in compressed sensing. So yes, sparsity helps. But margin has better, more, because margin appears here as well. So if the classes are far apart and they are well uh, uh, clumped, so compact, there is a large margin between them, then we are dividing by this margin. And also, this Gaussian width uh, decreases with the margin, because if, if the margin was la uh, large and the, and the class is compact, then the angle between the extreme points within a class is small, and that decreases this one. Another example is if the data is on a linear subspace. So it looks like high dimensional data, but actually they are all lying on a subspace, embedded in there. Then this is going to be for the square root of the dimension of the subspace. And there are other examples. Good, so that's what we found on compressive classifier. Now we take that insight to the original problem. So, so far we have seen that a random projection can exploit the structure, the geometry of the data support, and that explains why for things like image classification or, or uh, face recognition, randomly projected classifiers work Great, surprisingly well. And then on things like gene expression classification or classification of medical images that are quite noisy and difficult, then random projection is not so good. So now we understand why. The structure underlying the problem is why. And now what we want is can we use the same in the original data space? So in the original data space, we knew from classical theory that the best we can do in general is square root of d over n. So there is lower bound as well. And here I want to tell you that we can do better. How come? Well, in this way. For the original problem, so age is origin in the original uh, high dimensional function space, uh, we can bound the generalization error by the average of the flipping probabilities times two, uh, so minimum between that and one. So if the point is misclassified, then it's one. If it's not, then it's, we take twice the flipping probability, plus square root of k over n, so not d over n, k over n, plus some small error term. So basically what we gained here is instead of square root of d over n, we have k over n smaller at the price of counting some error, the exactly the flipping probability error for the points that are correctly classified in the training set. So basically, it doesn't contradict the existing lower bound because in the existing lower bound you have d here, but zero one loss here. So now what I'm saying is, you can choose k as small as you want, and this is the price to pay, which you can measure on the sample. So in the original theory, they have zero one loss here, square root of d over n, and basically what tells you is that you need to have n larger than something in order to guarantee uh, a good generalization error. What I'm saying is, you have n, and even if I wish to have it larger, I don't have it. So I have n training points. And then what I'm saying, I can adjust the complexity uh, in the bound to the size of the data that I have. So if this is small, I will put k small. And I can measure on the training sample what error uh, that induces, and the two together give me a bound on the generalization error. 
And again, if k goes up to d, then this disappears. It's going, it, it becomes the zero one error, and we recover the original VC bound. And why is this good? Not just that I can measure it on the data, but I know from the slides before that this uh, flip probability can be small in certain cases when there is good structure in the data. And the structures are the same. So if there is large margin, if uh, the data is on a subspace embedded in the high dimensions, if it's on a smooth manifold, if it's uh, sparse, and so on. So basically this term encodes the lucky structures of the data that help classification become an easier problem. So this is just an example of the terms. So varying k, and this is the bounds, and the uh, blue one is the flipping probability. The higher the k, the lower the flipping probability. The square root of k over n, so this is the complexity term, and the actual bound. Proof. How am I going with the time? How much time I have? Five to ten. All right, so maybe you believe the theorem then. And I show you some more things. So now I uh, have the same data set as as I uh, showed before that pulls the SVM classifier. And so if I minimize the bound, then I get this classifier, which as you see, uh, it's, it's more aligned with the overall structure of the data rather than pulled by the support vectors. And that one would be the zero one direct minimization. So that corresponds to K being very big. The same class, so this is a new classifier, which is very inefficient, no, I mean, uh, computationally, but it shows that the theory is good. Uh, we use it on some uh, UCI data sets. This is the classification error compared with SVM and some uh, other. So this is a recent classifier, right, which is uh, maximizing the av average margin and minimizing the variance of the margin. And we are doing quite well. So I'm going to skip these. So those slides were about uh, a variation on that bound that you have seen that then I can instantiate in different ways to uh, draw connections between methods. And so far, we have connection to the large margin distribution machine and with two views of boosting. So we have seen that if the task is solvable on a random subspace, then the label flipping is a quantity that is important in explaining when and why that works. We have seen that in the original uh, data space, the same quantity can explain when and why a problem is easier than others, and that we don't need any of those sparse representation conditions for the bounds to hold. So the bound always holds, and if we have sparse representation or other structures, then the bound shows that uh, it, it tightens, it becomes better. Now in the rest of the talk, I wanted to show you uh, that the same idea works in non-parametric classification, and then I wanted to show that you can take uh, the compressed classifiers build an ensemble and and it works at least as good as the original one. For the nearest neighbor, I'm only going to show you very few things. So it is known that the error is if you have infinitely many points, then the error converges to twice the base error and it is known that in order to have only epsilon more than twice the base error, then we need a sample size exponential in the dimension of the data in general. And the new result shows 
that for compressive, so again, we squash the data randomly and then we learn the nearest neighbors, then the sample complexity is exponential only in this quantity, which for now, let's say that's the Gaussian width. So th the way we derive this, it's, it's a, another complexity measure, but now I don't have time to detail it. It can be replaced with the Gaussian width without any problems. So that's like an intrinsic dimension. You can think about it that way. I, it's a, a notion of intrinsic dimension, which is at most D, but it can be much less if there is structure. And by implication, the data space nearest neighbor also scales the same way. And the proof is as short as this. So it's just based on the fact that the point who is nearest neighbor to a point, the distance must be smaller than the distance of the point from the point that would be nearest neighbor after the random projection. And then just applying the same as what we derived for random projection does the trick. How it's proven that, uh, oopsie. Okay, so this is uh, some examples that indeed that's the case. The data is on a linear subspace embedded in, embedded in three, di in, in fact, in 1,000 dimensions. So the, for a picture is three, but for the experiments is one. Thousand or 100, 100, sorry, 100 dimensions. And then we vary the sample size and measure the error on holdout set. And uh, the red line is for this data. The blue line is for this data. So both are much more uh, easier and less complex than the full 100-dimensional problem. But f out of these two, we see that the second one is an easier problem. It, it, it's a lower complexity data support than this one. And this shows indeed in the sample size required for small error. And this is the original nearest neighbor. This is the compressive. And they are remarkably similar. So if there is structure, good structure, then both work in the same way. The data is on a low dimensional smooth and low condition number manifold. And here, it's an uh, even lower dimensional manifold uh, union with a linear subspace. So again, this is simpler than that. And indeed, the sample complexity is lower than for that one. And again, in the two spaces, the results look quite similar. Same thing, but this time, uh, sparse data and the sparsity is varied. So small sparsity means smaller number of non-zeros in the points, on zero entries in the points. This is the samples required. And so we see that as the sparsity, if the number of non-zeros increase, the error increases quite rapidly. And the same in both spaces. And this is data on a, on a linear subspace. So these are all synthetic data sets. And uh, the same thing. So, in the last few minutes, I still want to talk about ensembles because it's, that's something that practically can be used and it can be parallelized. Uh, so each ensemble member is a, is a compressive classifier. So that means you don't need the original data at all. You can collect it in a compressed form and use it. And you need several compressed forms of the same data set. And then each classifier works on, a, on one of those random projections of the data. And you can run it on a core, on a different core each, and then combine their results. Specifically, here we use the Fisher discriminant analysis, but it doesn't have to be that one. It, it, this was simple enough, so, so simple that we could go even further with the analysis, even deeper to see what exactly is going on. Uh, so it works as follows. It assumes each class is a drawn from a Gaussian with different means and the same covariance matrix. And then if you have a new point, say here, you take the shortest of the Mahalanobis distance. So Mahalanobis distance means that 
all these points on this ellipse boundary are at the same distance from the mean. I know this distance. And I'm going to uh, very briefly go through the theoretical part. So this is the prediction function of the Fisher discriminant analysis. These are the means, the two centers of the classes. And this sigma square is the covariance, so that determines the shape of the classes. And since we do random projection, then there is this R matrix everywhere. And now the ensemble will combine the linear predictions. So that means we have an average over the ensemble members of functions of this form. So they're just linear functions. And then we can take this uh, sum over here, because nothing depends on I here, and then we see that all that uh, matters, all that the ensemble does is assembling a bunch of covariance estimators. So these are small dimensional covariances to invest, and then fold it back, embed it back in the original space. So it's like uh, one slides, another slides, another slides, average those. Uh, and then in the limit, when we have infinitely many, then this converges to the expectation, and we can analyze this expectation. Now recently, I didn't put that in the slides, but in the algorithmic learning theory conference this year, we have a paper to show that we only need M to be linear in B, so we only need those many, so that these two are sufficiently close to each other. And then some nice properties of that matrix expectation, and we can show that this matrix expectation is doing a regularization function. So the condition number of that matrix expectation is bounded by the co uh, condition number of the range space. So even if the covariance estimate, the uh, sigma hat would be low rank, so not enough points, but the estimated covariance matrix. We only need the largest and the smallest non-zero eigenvalue times this constant that depends on rho is the rank of sigma hat, and k is what we choose the dimension for the random projections. And so the condition number that we get is always bounded by this, and it's always non-finite. So this is how it regularizes. Then uh, condition on the training set, so a fixed training set, then we can calculate the generalization error exactly, because in this case, we know that the classes are from Gaussian. So we know the distribution. We can calculate it exactly. And its form is exactly the same as you would read from the textbooks in for Fisher discriminant analysis. The difference is that instead of sigma hat, here we have this S matrix this one, and everything else stays the same. It does, the ensemble does a regularization of the covariance estimate. And using that, we can bound the generalization error of the ensemble, and it's a long expression, but what you can see is, when, as the number of points increases, this time goes away, this time goes away, this time goes away, and this is uh, uh, bounded, we can show it, and this remains, so basically the distance between the means is what matters. Experiments. Uh, high dimensional data sets, so the colon data set is 2,000 dimensional. Leukemia, we have two versions, one is 3,500, the other is 7,000 something. We also did experiments with a large chemical data set, unfortunately didn't put it on the slides. So they are higher dimensional than number of points. So clearly the original theory that was saying that you need square root of, uh, that the error is of the order square root of uh, d over n, what would that be here? So 2,000 over 62, that would be not, not very informative if the error is that much. Um, so we run some experiments, standardize the features in the usual way, so zero mean unit variance, uh, 
we compared it with the regularized Fisher discriminant analysis, since we figured out that we do some kind of regularization implicitly. Uh, we compared it also with diagonal Fisher discriminant analysis. Uh, okay. And these are the results. It looks like a good choice for K in this case, for example, is the rank of the covariance divided by two. And I can tell you why if we have time. And so that's what we used. Ensemble of 100 classifiers, ensemble of 1,000 classifiers, and SVM. And we can see that we get comparable errors. So we don't want to say that we are doing better than SVM with this. But we can say safely that it's a state of the art uh, result with an ensemble that is much cheaper than SVM. So we don't have any uh, difficult optimization here to do. All we have to do is collect random projections of the data and run Fisher discriminant several times on different cores, collect the results together into an ensemble, and so in cheap way we can get state of the art performance. And this is how uh, the parameters affect it. Okay, so this is probably the last slide, and this is better. Uh, so this is the baseline, and we can do better in most of the cases. In fact, all the high dimensional cases, here you see better actually. This is the improvement, this is the improvement, this is the improvement. So that's the last thing. And uh, so what we have seen to sum up is that uh, simple averaging ensembles, we analyze it in detail, and we have seen why and when the random projection uh, helps the classification. To ex extend this to other uh, learning settings, we of course need to do further work. Thank you very much for Thanks a lot, Atta, for the 